So I just want to take a look at the syllabus here just to see where we're at in the class and then just talk about a few things. So just give me one second here. So, uh, so we are here, we, well, I don't know if it doesn't really matter, but maybe you have two weeks, well, 13 next week, but uh, that'll push everything down, but that doesn't really make a difference. I just noticed it when I was looking at it. Um, so, got reading from the Elliott text for today. There's another reading. I know we jump around a lot. Um, there's another reading that's on it's in the folder. So let me just take a look here. Um, uh, let me just make sure that I tell you what the reading is for Wednesday. It's a little bit longer reading, but just be sure you go down the week. I think it's 11. Yeah, so week 11 and 13. Read out of this for Wednesday, okay? Um, so, two readings, and then Friday and Monday, we have a, we're going to be watching a documentary. Um, the, the reading actually alludes to uh, this. Uh, it's actually the documentary is based on the book of the same name. I think the reading alludes to this called The Merchants of Doubt. Um, so, that means there is no quiz on Friday, but um, the material from this week uh, could be on next week. Okay, so just uh, so this material is not something that won't be on quiz this Friday because we don't, I don't have enough time. I looked at the like the documentary. It, it, I'll have just enough time in two class sessions to show this. Uh, so just be aware that's what's going on. Um, the other thing I need to do, I know. Apologize for kind of. Um, I need to push the due date. I'm not going to, I guess, you probably aren't going to care if you have a little more time to do it, although you might just want to get it over with by this point. Your paper, I'm going to have to uh, push it to the eighth. Okay. So I have it as being due on the fourth. Now it's due on the eighth. So it's just due on Friday instead of Monday. Okay. I don't know if that causes any inconvenience, huge inconvenience for people, but. I mean, I, my thing is I have, I teach three different classes and I try to have, you know, I got papers coming in from one class. I want to sort of give myself time to finish those. And so I didn't stagger these due dates exactly. Sometimes you try to plan ahead months in advance and it doesn't always work out very well. So Friday, April 8th, that's when your paper is, okay? The beginning of class. Are there any questions about the paper? Okay. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. What else did I want to? Uh, I did spend, I think, I don't remember what day it was before spring break. Um, I think it was probably Wednesday of that week before spring break. Uh, so there is a recording of that class if you want to go back and watch it if you weren't here. But I did go over in some detail exactly how to structure the paper, how to write the paper, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you do have questions about that, please let me know. But I did go over that in pretty great detail. You guys all remember that class that I'm talking about? Okay. Um, so. Is there anything else? Um, any questions about anything? Are you guys no longer Will Smith fans? <laughs> I uh, I don't know why. I just it, it didn't. I, I assumed it was a joke that the internet made when I woke up this morning, and then I watched it and it was totally surreal. I don't know if anybody else had the same reaction. Like you couldn't. Like, but anyways, anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone not know what I'm talking about? 
well, Google it and find, you'll find out. But not right now. Um, but it's it's um. Anyways, <laughs> I just uh, that that's been on my mind this morning. Great. Let me get me back to. All right. So I want to also just wanted to say something. Um, so so I want to start actually by showing you a short video as it relates to today's reading. If you did today's reading, I think this will be pretty obvious the connection that is attempting to be here. Um, so one second here, I'm going to show this and then we're going to talk about today's reading. Okay. So big night, the night. The curtain is up. But Bill, isn't it a problem when science guys attempt to bully other people? I mean, it's not working with the public. Well, this is about tornadoes. That's the same thing. Yes. Yeah, this is how conversations about climate change often go down. Scientists say climate change is real, but people still doubt them. So why isn't the science enough? It's not like there's a shortage of scientific facts out there spelling it all out for us. But let's be honest, not many people can relate to scientists sharing their data, no matter how compelling it is. When I give talks as a scientist versus when I'm talking to a friend, I don't think I'm any more persuasive. In fact, I think as a scientist, I may be actually less trusted. The problem is you have people who are very, very smart when it comes to reading data, but they're dumb when it comes to dealing with people. So people's relationship to smarty pants people, uh, I think you have to take into account. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But this guy, he cares. Dr. Veerabhadran Ramanathan, known by many as Ram, is an atmospheric scientist at UC San Diego's Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And for decades, he's been a leading and prescient voice on climate change, long before the term was widely known. Ram also designs instruments to measure climate data on satellites, aircraft, and ships. But he feels like he's really just writing obituaries for the planet. Every time I come back for my, one of my expeditions, it's always I bring back bad news. His scientific findings were simply not inspiring public action. So Ram got creative. He's been a science advisor for the Vatican since 2004. In 2014, Ram was chosen to speak directly to Pope Francis. Now, he only had three minutes, literally a parking lot pitch outside the Pope's apartment at the Vatican. Ram had memorized a few sentences in Spanish, but when he saw the Pope emerge from his fiat, he just blanked out. Big night, the night. The curtain is up, and the spotlight is on you. I completely panicked. It was a panic attack. Then I said, heck with it. I'm going to tell him in English. With a translator between them, Ram told the Pope that climate change was a moral and ethical issue. Most of the pollution comes from the wealthiest one billion, and the worst consequences of that is going to be for the poorest three billion, who had almost nothing to do with this pollution. At this moment, I had finished my two sentences. In English, hopefully. English, yeah. And he asked me in Spanish, what can he do about this? And you're looking quite confused with a, yeah. with sort of trying to get your brain around what to say. Well, yes, I had not planned that. I told him that, look, you are now the moral leader of the world. So in your speeches, if you can ask people to be better stewards of the planet, that'll have a huge impact. Not only did Pope Francis include this message in an address several days later, but he even took his message to Twitter. This caused a sensation because it was the first time that the Catholic Church came out and talked about climate change to a global audience of over 1.2 billion Catholics. This chat with Ram and the Pope actually led to what's been called the Francis Effect. 35% of Catholics said that the Pope's message changed their personal views on climate change. I know if I had planned all this whole thing, it would have been totally different. I would have gone into carbon dioxide, this, all the pollution, the science scientific speech. details. Yeah. Since I was not prepared, I went to my heart. I could have blown this. 
Instead, Ram jokes that those three minutes were the best scientific moments of his life. They were certainly one of his most influential. Just by switching the messenger from a scientist to a religious figure, people listened. And perhaps nowhere is the messenger more important than in politics. In the US, climate change has become a fiercely partisan issue. The majority of Americans are concerned about climate change, but there's a sharp difference between liberals and conservatives on the issue. And that's largely attributed to who they're getting their information from, regardless of what the science actually says. If the Earth becomes a partisan issue, everybody loses. The good thing is you're now seeing people on the conservative and libertarian right saying, hey, hold on a second. We have a right and a liberty as American homeowners to power our homes as we please. Debbie Dooley, a co-founder of the Tea Party movement, is one of these conservatives. People that did not know me made the mistake of calling me a tree-hugging, left-wing liberal, a founder of the Tea Party movement. I laughed and I said, well, clearly they don't know me. I am probably the first well-known conservative in Georgia to come out on a grassroots level and advocate for solar. I don't like monopolies. They deserve competition and choice. And Debbie agrees that there really is no reason that climate change should be a partisan issue. It's more fiscally responsible to prevent damage to the environment than it is to clean it up. As Ronald Reagan said, being good stewards of the environment God gave us should not be a partisan issue. Focus on a message that resonates no matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent. And the last time I checked, this earth belongs to all of us. All of us want clean air or water, and we need to protect it. To get this message out, Debbie founded Conservatives for Energy Freedom, and they recently helped defeat... So, I've seen enough of it to kind of get the, the point that I wanted to get from the... Uh, as it relates to today's reading. Um, because today's reading, so we've been dealing with this... Well, uh, actually, if you recall, going back several weeks after the midterm, uh, we were talking about this general topic of and that's where we had been we did the Heather Douglas reading um, dealing with whether or not scientists can be held responsible for the kinds of claims that they make then we did the Elliot reading which sort of just piggybacks right on the Heather Douglas reading because it actually sort of discusses her by name in the reading, and we looked at those three different approaches, modified clean hands, clean hands, and um, advocacy. And all along the way, we've really been dealing with this talk. When there is scientific uncertainty, how should it be communicated to the public? That's really what's been hanging over all of this. Because it seems like on the one hand, you have an obligation of the scientists to be accurate and uphold your right epistemic, but you also have duty to warn the public about potential dangerous things, right? So we but so we when science is uncertain, how should it be communicated? That's sort of the big general question we've been dealing with. Now, in today's reading, we, we come at uncertainty from a slightly different topic. Because in this sense, now there's not, right, we've been dealing with actual uncertainty. There actually has been uncertainty in the data. James Hansen communicated when he communicated the climate science wasn't there yet. But the difference in what we're doing today is instead of dealing with actual scientific uncertainty, we're now just dealing with perceived scientific uncertainty. Because, as it was discussed in the video, and as it's discussed in the reading, there are a lot of scientific controversies for which there is perceived uncertainty, but there is no actual uncertainty. And that's the difference in what we're talking about for today. Looking at entire industries that exist to try to confuse people about science that is not really that astute. Climate science is obviously a big one. Seems another one. There's several mentioned in today's reading. 
Vaccines and climate science are probably the biggest ones. I think the reading also mentions uh, GMOs or another one. But we've got entire industries devoted to trying to confuse the public and say, hey, the science isn't clear on this. And why? 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 Why would they do that? Yeah. Right. They have an obvious economic incentive to confuse people and make it seem as if the science isn't certain. They have an obvious economic and financial incentive to do that. Because if something is done, then maybe people will stop buying their products, one, or they're going to be regulated by the government. There's going to be some kind of regulation placed on these industries, and they stand to lose money if they're regulated. They're going to, it's going to make the cost of producing their energy, for example, more expensive. And so that's what we're dealing with today, is how to deal with the existence of perceived uncertainty and how is it that we try to navigate how do we navigate science communication in an environment where entire industries exist to confuse people? How on earth do you try to communicate science in that environment? When they don't know what's true. When they look around and they really don't know what's true. And of course, going back to the reading, you remember the, do you know the example that's mentioned in the reading is sort of the first instance of this? Going back to the middle? Yeah. Right. You remember what their slogan was, what it said? It's four words. Yeah. Like, be reliable doubt. Doubt is our product, right? But that's precisely it. It was the tobacco industry. Going all the way back to the 60s and 70s. Basically saying, don't know if smoking causes cancer. Don't know. Why not? People are trying to scare you about cigarettes. So, I mean, we, we have now, you know, looking back at that, you can kind of look back at that and think, wow, that's pretty crazy that a company was willing to, to try to do that because we, you know, there's, there's no doubt anymore. But and even, in the, even in the minds of the tobacco companies, they also knew that there wasn't any doubt. But if they could create the perception of doubt, then that's all you need. You just need that, you just need to plant that seed of doubt and you're accomplishing your goal. And again, so obviously, right, that stems largely from economic and financial reasons. But the reading also, the reading mentions, right, often the companies that are doing this have hired their own scientists, right? They brought in their own scientists known as industry scientists. And they're, you know, it's not really all that difficult to figure out what's wrong with, with doing something like that. I think most of us would agree that it is unethical to try to confuse the public about science that there's not really any confusion about. But as the reading indicates, it wasn't only industry scientists that were doing this. There were well-respected scientists who weren't working for, you know, big energy or big tobacco or whatever, you know, put big and then substitute the science and call it big. And there were well-respected, well-known scientists who also were not willing to buy into the science of climate change. And this highlights a deeper problem because, again, this is, I mean, this is easy to spot. If you find a scientist who's employed by Philip Morris, Philip Morris was the name of the big tobacco. If you find somebody, you, you see that byline next to their name that Philip Morris employs them, you know, you already know to be suspicious of anything that they said. But if you find somebody who's just a regular scientist doing this, well, that's a little harder to kind of figure out. Why would they be doing this? Because they don't have an economic or financial incentive to lie about the science the same way that industry scientists would. So why, 
Why would a well-respected, well-known scientist who isn't working for the industry do this? I think the reading hints at this a little bit, mentions something about this. Yes, yes. Right. You remember what specifically it was? What was it? Yeah, free markets. Remember like the time period? What was going on between like, right? This was during the Cold War. And the, the um, it's not lost on me right now that I'm talking about the Cold War as it's as if it's in the past tense, but given current political circumstances, I'm not sure that it is in the past tense anymore, but you know. Uh, anyways, that's just sort of striking me as I as I talk about the Cold War. Um, but during this time, it was often, you know, you this was kind of a battle between, you know, communism and, and democracy or slash capitalism, right? And that's often how that's often how this was viewed. You couldn't sort of have it both ways. You either stood with the forces of democracy and capitalism and free markets, or you stood with the evil forces of communism, right? And that's sort of how this, of course, it's much more complicated than that, but at least rhetorically, that's a very sort of quick way to kind of figure out where you stay. And what Elliot points out is that some of these scientists during this time period, as, as climate science is emerging, right? Because re recall that, well, the Berlin Wall falls, what, 1989, 1990, that's when the Berlin Wall falls. Um, so the Cold War, and I was just trying to think, because Hansen gave his speech to Congress that we talked about in like 1988 or something. So, you know, you can imagine that there's the Cold War, you know, roughly, you know, post-World War II to, to, you know, the mid-1980s, end of the 1980s. And um, I'm just trying to think of climate science is emerging as a science during this time period. This is when climate science is emerging during this time period. And so you can see how if certain scientists, you know, supported this, something like free markets, then they might be suspicious of something like climate science because, of course, climate science, in order to do something about climate change, it's going to require what? What's that? Policies. Oh, yeah, exactly. Governmental policies. It's going to require huge governmental action, coordinated governmental action between not just our government, but other governments, right? And so, yeah, anybody who has, anybody who's living during this time period and is kind of stuck in this ideological framework would be concerned when they hear that government regulation is going to be needed to help, you know, save the planet or something. Does, everybody, does that make sense? Does everybody see that? Right? So, that's just trying to point to a deeper issue here. Because, again, just to reiterate, this isn't hard to figure out. We know that if you're an industry scientist, you have an obvious agenda. But if you're not an industry scientist and you're still pushing, you're still trying to confuse people about science, it seems to suggest that there's no disagreement. About disagreement about what? Is that? No, there's a distinction made in the reading between facts and, and this, this goes back to, yeah. Well, it's just, yeah, I mean, you're getting it. I think you're on the right track. It's just one word. What's that? Values. Yeah, it's a disagreement about that. That's, that's what this reading is really getting at. Because as the video points out, as the reading points out, disagreement about science, it would be easy if the disagreement were just about facts. <coughs> if, you, if, if it was possible to just change somebody's mind by giving them facts, um, I, mean, I don't think we have a lot of the issues that we have. I think most of you all you realize this already is that 
scientific disagreement seems to be stemming more from values rather than facts. And I'm just going to, just to kind of put this in the jargon, right? This would just be a nearly epistemic disagreement, whereas this would be a normative disagreement. Or a value laden is simply another you know, way of saying normative. And so, if scientific disagreement is more rooted in our values rather than our facts, well, what the heck are we supposed to do about that? How do we navigate that environment? Or somebody where, in other words, no matter the facts that you give them, they will never, they will never agree. Because, in other words, it's almost as if, if you are a lot, in other words, if you as a scientist are approaching disagreement from a fact-based perspective, somebody else who's listening to you hears you from a values-based perspective, and you're just talking <coughs> past each other. You inhabit, you're inhabiting one sphere, and somebody else is inhabiting another sphere. And there's no communication isn't even happening. Because you are occupying one sphere of human experience, which is a fact one, and somebody else is occupying a whole different sphere. And there's no, there's no actual communication happening. You're not actually hearing each other. Which is why, so that's why I started with the video, because the, the video is at least trying to suggest that if we inform our scientific communication with values rather than merely facts, maybe there might be some hope to, commu to actually communicate. <clears throat> because what, what are we talking about here? We talked about political. What else are we talking about here besides political? Values-based areas of our lives. What else besides religion? Religious. Yeah, religious is definitely one. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I could, yeah, you could say community. You could probably say like social values, kind of. Yeah, but all of these have to do with way of our way of life. You know, your way of life as it relates to the political values is the, the role that you think the government should play in your life. That's a very deep seated part of us, part of our identity. Same with religious. Whether you believe in a higher being is a very deep-seated personal part of who you are. So anyways, <clears throat> if this is where people are coming from when they disagree with science, then the question is, what should we do about it? How do we, how do we do anything? I mean, the video obviously points to some suggestions, but um, what do you think? I mean, is there an obligation here? Is there an obligation here to engage in value-based communication? Say there's an obligation. In other words, if we if we make the recognition that scientific disagreement is more based in values, then does that mean that we need to 
shift our communication strategy entirely? Because the reading mentions hitting people over the head with science. It's a sort of a metaphor for just saying, here's some facts, here's some statistics, here's some charts. Here it is, here it is. How can you not see it? Right? Here it is. Believe it. Right? That will never, <laughs> that's never going to work because they are approaching it from this perspective. They're not asking, is the science true? That's not all they're asking, right? From this perspective, they're saying, if the science is true, how will my life change as a result? That's the question they're asking. You see what I mean by that difference? If the science is true, how will my life change? So if climate change, if climate change is true, if the predictions about it are true, how will I have to change my life as a result? Well, I might have to, I don't know, drive an electric car. I don't know. If that's the big thing right now. Um, what else? I'm trying to think of other ones besides climate. I mean, climate change is the big one. You obviously dealt with masks and vaccines a lot in the past two years. I get that. Those are other ones. Is there any other topics like this? I mean, am I missing any? What about... Can you do this? I mean, you've got climate change. I know we've got climate change. I know we've got vaccines. Those are two big ones. Are there any other industries that exist to try to confuse people about that I'm missing here? Do you guys think of any besides climate change and vaccines? I would say like, you could argue that a lot of like bad diets yeah. kind of confuse people because like the vast majority of them are very like we need to get mm -hmm. so unhealthy but yet we think that like oh because someone else does it it, it must be that it, it you buy into their products and their so like yeah like almost like lifestyle science kind of and of course lifestyle means how you eat right but yeah there's so much of that for example there's so much of how you should eat and how you how much you should exercise and all of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, GMOs are another one the reading mentions. And I think that's connected to this because that has to do with how you eat. Right? Something is has the label genetically modified. You, I don't know, like you like are worried that you shouldn't eat it or something because it's been genetically modified. You know, no, no matter what the science actually means, you just hear the word genetically modified and it kind of throws up alarm bells for you. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I feel like this could be wrong, but like vaping? Vaping? Is... Yeah, I mean, are there, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I think that if it's good. So if we had to think about a contemporary analog to cigarettes, I mean, I think the vaping industry, so to speak. I, I don't even know, but uh, I mean, they, they are fighting hard not to be regulated. They don't want to be regulated. They want to be able to sell their products in the free market, right? Which I had up here before. They don't want to be told that even if, you know, they want to, they want to try to say, no, vaping isn't bad. And of course, Vaping emerged as a kind of way to try to quit smoking. That's at least how I understand like when vaping emerged, it was a serious attempt to try to wean people off of cigarettes. But now with all of the crap that's in the formula, they won't even, you know, they won't give out the formulas for what's actually in the liquid that you're putting in the thing, right? So yeah, no, I think if I I, I actually think that makes sense as a as a sort of contemporary example as it relates to smoking. I guess with all of this, I'm just I'm just kind of thinking to go back to the question I asked before. How do we what do we do about this? Like what is the like if scientific disagreement is rooted more in values than in facts, how do we communicate science? How do we communicate? 
Because again, the question from a scientific perspective might be, is this true? The question from a values-based perspective is, if this is true, how will my life change? And I'm just trying to think like, how do we, is there a way to communicate? Can you think of any examples of how to communicate science in a way that incorporates values, but doesn't diminish the science at the same time? I don't know. Well, of course, the video gives one example. What did he decide? What was the example in the video? I mean, what did this guy who works at UC San Diego decide to do? What calculation did he make? as it relates to values. How did you understand that example? Yeah. Instead of just hitting, like the, like the article said, hitting him over the head with just evidence, evidence he wanted to relate to the moral and ethical right. relationship. Yeah. Yeah, so he, yeah. He realized he was gonna have this moment with the Pope. The Pope, well, notwithstanding the fact that the Pope might not even understand the science either, but also, this is a very, very influential person who has access to millions and millions of people all the time. So why not try to appeal to values instead of just facts and allow the Pope to be the messenger for you? So yeah, I mean, and, you know, as the data bore out at least, there was an increase in, um, you know, because there, there is a kind of religious, Orientation there, being a good steward of the environment, so to speak. That's a kind of thing that can be a religious orientation that you have. Um, what else? What, what, you're, you're, yeah. yeah, it's like what he could do about it. Yeah. What to do specifically. The Pope. Yes. Yeah. Right. So it said, yeah, he wanted to, like, people need to take action, right? And so, good. He doesn't just want to know a bunch of facts. He wants to say, what needs to be done? to sort of solve this problem. Yeah. So the reading, right, the reading then mentions, so one possibility is what? You find a respected leader in a field from the opposing side and you put them in front of your group of people and you ask them to do the community. So the, the lady that was mentioned in the video there towards the end, right? She is she's a libertarian slash conservative who stereotypically at least tends to oppose things like government regulation and government intervention. But if you can frame it as economic, if you can frame it in economic terms, then people might be more willing to buy it, right? People might be more willing to listen to you if you frame the message in terms that they understand. So in other words, I'm just listing another kind of value here. You just frame the message in economic terms rather than religious terms, or rather than only scientific terms or political terms. You say, look, it's actually going to be cheaper for your company to install solar panels. It's actually economically beneficial for your company to do this. Then you avoid the whole, there you're, you're speaking their language there. Do you think of any other examples of this? Where you have to appeal the values of the audience to convince them speaking in their own language, their own terms, so that they might be more likely to believe you. I think with climate change, one example is framing it in economic terms. Because again, when you're thinking about something like this, if you're right, if climate change, if, if, if science is true about climate change, right, this industry right, is, is, is sort of becoming a thing of the past pretty quickly. And that means the loss of jobs. So if you can say to somebody, instead of going underground and mining for coal, maybe you can build solar panels instead. And I know it seems kind of lame, but it's like, that's, I mean, that would be an example of trying to appeal to a message in a certain way 
right? Because does anybody know anyone who did it in any families work in the coal industry? Anyone? I mean, it's like an entire way of life, right? Your whole life is built around the coal industry. It's not just a job. It's, it's a whole way of life, right? So if the coal industry is sort of fading, then you try to show why you can still have a, you can still be prosperous and have a paycheck. It just, you might be doing it at not doing what you imagine, and, and you might not be inhaling toxic smoke all day. So that might be a good health benefit as well. But I guess, anyways, I'm just trying to kind of think here, though. Do you think that it's, in other words, is it too much of a burden to place this burden on scientists to say, it's on you to engage in values-based communication? Does that let, does that let, the public off the hook. Does that let them off the hook? So, right, if, if the public are the ones who are disagreeing on the basis of political, religious, community, economic, that's why they are rejecting science. My religious views, my political views, that it doesn't allow me to believe that the science is true. So Given that, is it too much then, I guess, to ask scientists to have to acknowledge that in their communication? Or not? Is that like, is that too big of an ask? You see what, you know what I'm asking? Is that, what's that? I'm just asking, does it let the public off the hook too much if we tell the scientists that they're the ones who have to engage in values-based communication. Doesn't that possibly just let these people off the hook for rejecting science? You think or not? You do. I would say no, because, I mean, it doesn't make a difference. Like, you can understand why I disagree, but it won't change the outcome unless you... I don't know, public's pretty stupid, I feel like, in general. So, like, I mean, you can't hold them accountable for that. I mean, you should be more aware of how to approach it, the overall benefit. Um, but I still think everyone's liable for their actions. They're still responsible. For so you're saying it's, you're saying the obligation does exist to engage in that communication? I'm saying they should, but it's not, yeah. yeah. So it's not letting them off the hook? No, I would not say they're off the hook. But they should still be smart at the Okay. I just, I mean, I, I, you, yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. You're saying there, there seems to be some responsibility on both sides. It's not an either or thing. There seems to be some responsibility on both sides. Is that, is that kind of what the rest of you think or not? Yeah. I think that if scientists like include the values in their communication, then there is still some obligation to the public, but I think it takes a lot off of them. So in a way it does kind of let them off the hook because when communicating science, if you're, if it's completely value-based, then that can kind of skew the whole thing. So right. I, don't, I don't think that's so Yeah, I mean, I see what you're, no, I mean, I, I think that's a good point. I think that if we say, well, look, the public, no matter what you say, the public is going to disagree with you on the basis of their politics, their religion, and their economic you know, well-being, no matter what you say. So because of that, you need to appeal to their political, their religious, their community-based values. You need to appeal to those things. But then, as you're saying, the un maybe an unintended consequence of that is, well, now you're an advocate. So to go back to that discussion. Now you're now you're only now you're including values in your messaging too much, and the science then becomes undermined in the process. You follow that? I, yeah, I agree. I think it lets the public off the hook like way too much. Like, I don't know, in my opinion, I just don't think that they should be able to just listen to facts and be like, no, like I think like, no. Right. Like I think they do have some sort of responsibility on themselves to like see how it fits in and benefit themselves. Like, I feel like they don't need to be like, directly told everything. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that is, 
Anyone else agree with that sentiment? Feels like kind of letting or kind of giving them a pass here, we'll say. No, it's okay to reject science on the basis of your religion and your politics. Go ahead. Let's make the scientists do all the work to communicate to you. Now, again, I'm not saying that, that, that that's, I'm, I'm, I'm being intentionally kind of facetious in saying it that way. But I mean, it does seem to give them a pass. Because now we're just saying it's okay to reject science on these bases. Anyone else? What do you guys think? You think that's... I mean, I guess it would depend. It's probably, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I, I think it's too sort of context dependent to some extent to kind of make a general statement here. But I mean, can you, are there certain, if somebody rejects science because their way of life is going to change, Does that make you understand anything about why people reject science? Does that help at all? Or do you still just regard them as kind of the dumb, ignorant folk? Like, in other words, if somebody had to say, my way of life has to fundamentally change if I accept that this is true, <laughs> does that like give you any sympathy for them at all? Or do you just kind of regard them as dumb? I don't know, I'm just trying to think. Yeah. I'm like, if you can get diagnosed with something like diabetes, like, it, I mean, sure, it's up to them if they want to change their lifestyle. And, but, I mean, it, like, there are consequences if you don't, and it's proven by facts. So I think at certain point, like, you can reject it, don't believe it, but you're only harming yourself in the process. That's true, and I understand that. I do. I certainly understand that perspective. I just wanted to, you know, I think that, you know, this, this kind of, I'm not saying this is what you said, but this idea that facts are facts. Well, to somebody who has to change their life as a result of a fact, a fact is not just a fact. It's not just a fact. Because the fact being true has consequences for their values. And so these facts don't just exist in this kind of neutral space. Does that, does that make sense? Now, again, I'm not saying I agree. I'm just saying that this, this, this becomes very, this becomes complicated very quickly when you're in the business of communicating science. Yeah. To me, it just seems kind of selfish to just be like, well, I'm just going to disregard that because it would have to change my life. But, but in her example, where it doesn't affect someone else, sure, if you wanted to not believe it, that's on you. But if you're like, oh, climate change isn't real, I'm going to keep just like destroying the environment just because you don't want to change your life. Like that has like widespread effects. And I think that's really selfish to just disregard it because of these powers. Okay. All right. No, 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 no. I, I, I suspect others share that perspective. I would say, but like, I see that, but also if you're working for, let's say, doing uh, work for the industry, but that's the only way you can provide for your family, and that you don't you want to necessarily get a job in the new solar powered factory, you'd be, you know, bought out or outclassed by the new younger generation, and then you can feed your family. And in the end, that's all you have. Does that make sense what he said? Because I do think, I think there's, I think some of you have these examples in mind of like, you know, well, fuck it, I'm just going to pollute it. Right? I'm just going to keep living my lifestyle. You know, I'm going to keep making the planet dirty, all that. That's, that's certain. And if it's, if it's entirely from selfish motivation, yeah, I think that's probably. But if somebody is like, my grandfather was a coal miner, or my father was a coal miner, that's all I know. I'm not, I am a coal miner. That's been my life plan for me. I'm going to go coal, go mine the coal. But now they're shutting down a local coal plant. What should I do? Anyways, I think that's, so I, I think there's room for maybe, but again, I, I could be wrong. But anyways, we'll say more about this on Wednesday. I just wanted to kind of put that in front of you. Um, don't forget the, the other reading is not from the Elliott book for Wednesday, but um, that other PDF. Okay.
Thank you. Um, 